This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 272, recorded on August 18th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from, I don't know, somewhere in Michigan, Michelle Swanson, <laughs> up north. And Good to from St. Louis, Missouri. Petra Levin. Hello, Petra. Hello. It's good to be here. I, I can tell where you are because you have the whiteboard behind <laughs> My messy whiteboard. I, usually, you know, it's funny. So, many of my podcasters are either at home or in their office. And I know when they're in their office because they have a whiteboard. I assume they don't have a whiteboard at home. <laughs> Most people don't. Most people don't. <laughs> there are a bunch in my garage left over from when my kids were in college. They just threw them in there when they came home, <laughs> and they're still there. And I don't want it anymore. Too many bad memories, I guess. <laughs> All right. How's, how's the uh, summers going for you guys? Good? Too damn fast. Yeah, it's almost over, right? Two weeks. <laughs> yeah, very fast. I'm already working on my syllabus for this fall. Starting yeah. teaching a class in the fall, right? Yeah, yeah I teach infectious disease. Uh -huh. uh, writing intensive class to upper level students. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm. I officially teach at Columbia in the spring, but I want to do an online course this fall, but um, uh, a live stream course. But I have to prepare it. It's not something I've done before, so I have to wow. work on it. That, that could take some time. Yeah, I'm hoping the next two weeks. I'm not traveling for two weeks, so I can get it done then. So my, my book with you. My, my <laughs> text, my class at Columbia is based on process, right? Every uh, lecture is a different process in virus reproduction. And now for an advanced course, I want to teach a virus by virus course where now you've got the fundamentals. So now we can talk about individual viruses. So it's hard because I, I don't know a lot about other than coronaviruses right? and maybe coronas <laughs> now, but I'll learn. It's fine. I know I'm introducing, um, pox viruses to my course and I haven't really used them, but because of monkey pox, I thought I'd yeah. add them. And that's, no, that's a whole a different good. viral category that I haven't taught before too. Yeah. Fortunately, we have Rich Condit on TWIV who's a pox virologist. So that's covered and I've learned <laughs> a lot about those. Uh, but, but we are uh, lifelong learners, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah. And and now polio virus is in the news again. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it's always- Unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, it's unfortunate when viruses are in the news, right? Because mostly never good. they're there when uh, bad things happen. Although you know, viruses can do good things, and but press doesn't seem to be interested in that. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about microbes today, and let's start with a snippet from Michelle. <laughs> yes, this is titled "Activating Natural Product Synthesis Using CRISPR Interference and Activation Systems in Streptomyces." And it is from a group at Rice University, um, led by Andrea Amoroso, Maria Claudia villages Com, Catherine Piper-Cohen, and James Chappelle. And it was published in July 2022 in Nucleic Acids Research, and it's open access, so you can follow along at home. <laughs> They're motivated, <laughs> really, by um, the global threat of antimicrobial resistance infection. And according to a 2019 report by the CDC, nearly 5 million deaths in 2019 worldwide were caused by infections um, of by um, antimicrobial resistant bugs. And in the U.S., um, more than 2.8 million antimicrobial resistant infections occur every year and more than 35,000 deaths. So we all need to um, do what we can to advance discovery of new antimicrobials. And fortunately, the field of genomics is putting us in a position to do natural product discovery and tap the wealth of uh, microbial products that we have not yet discovered that could potentially be used um, therapeutically. So for this um, purpose, the 
soil bacteria, Streptomyces, have been used for, for more than 50 years because they're known to produce a lot of um, microbial or antimicrobial products and other um, molecules. And on average, Streptomyces strains encode 39 biosynthetic gene clusters. So these are large um, segments of DNA that rather than encode proteins through the canonical mRNA goes to the ribosome, makes a protein. Instead, they encode dozens of genes that direct the synthesis, transport, and also regulation of a natural product that's, that's manufactured by the cell in a, in a non-canonical manner. And one, one challenge, though, is that the bacteria are generally keeping these natural products off in, unless they're confronting a particular environmental stress that the product can assist with. So when we culture bacteria in rich media at 37 degrees in the lab, the bacteria are not making these uh, wonderful, weird and wonderful molecules. So this has been a hurdle um, to discovery. So there's been efforts to try to um, induce expression of these silent uh, loci and one simple strategy is just to modify the growth conditions, put the microbes under a bit of stress, like adding a sublethal concentration of antibiotic or co-culturing with another species. But still, that, that's laborious. It requires a lot of trial and error. So another approach is to try to get in and override the um, endogenous regulatory systems of the microbe to get them to induce expression of these um, natural products under laboratory conditions. So for example, um, there is a well-conserved global stress response pathway that is governed by the signaling molecule PPGPP, otherwise known as an alarmone, that um, alters RNA polymerase promoter selection. So in Streptomyces, they've engineered a strain that mimics the like constitutively PPGPP bound state so that the polymerase now will um, express eight different previously unknown antimicrobial compounds. So there's hope that we can override the normal um, endogenous regulatory pathways. And that's what the goal of um, James Chappelle and his colleagues um, has been. And what they decided to do was to leverage what we've learned about CRISPR regulatory mechanisms. So they're going to use CRISPR technology which uh, to design precise insertions to activate expression of some of these biosynthetic gene clusters in a Streptomyces Venezuela strain. And this is timely because we've actually just reached the 10th anniversary of Jennifer Dwadna's landmark publication in Science called A Programmable Dual RNA-Guided DNA Endonuclease in Adaptive Bacterial Immunity. So it sounds very esoteric, but in fact, this was the birth announcement of CRISPR technology, which has revolutionized genetic engineering in microbes, in plants, in, in mammals, many living creatures, even discussions of using it to um, genetically manipulate the host, the human uh, genome. And it earned um, Jennifer Dwadna and her collaborator, Manuel Charpentier, the 2020 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So this is a really um, great application of the CRISPR technology. So in particular, um, it's known that the CRISPR system uses a single guide RNA that will sterically block transcription initiation, or they can use um, CRISPR to um, uh, harness the activation domain of the CRISPR system to um, turn on RNA polymerase activity at a particular site. So Michelle, the, the control is mainly at the level of transcription of all these clusters, right? It is. In, the, in this case, yes. So they took a, an incredibly logical and very systematic engineering approach. Um, in their paper, they lay out the rationale for each synthetic element they're going to build. And then they take us really systematically through the design and optimization of each of the um, st steps of the design. So first, um, they take advantage of a fluorescence reporter, um, the M. cherry gene, and they screened a large library of both natural and synthetic promoters to find a strong promoter whose um, simple design or architecture was amenable to engineering. So once they identified that promoter, then they um, turned their attention to how can we use um, CRISPR 
single guide RNAs to either inhibit transcription initiation or elongation. And they lay out this um, strategy schematically in figure 1A. So um, they first asked uh, whether it mattered whether they put the um, binding sites for the single guide RNA on the coding strand or the non-coding strand. And they also um, tested for at five different positions um, at di different distances from the transcriptional start site to see what was optimal. And what you can see in their uh, really beautifully co color-coded figure 1E is both the design of these different um, variants and the, the readout that they got with the M-cherry fluorescence. And you can see that they, they've got really terrific um, inhibition of the um, gene expression when they had these um, L particular CRISPR elements on the non-coding strand a particular distance from the uh, transcriptional start site. So really, again, very logical, systematic, let's really optimize each step. So they've got now in hand a um, design for shutting off uh, gene expression. So now they um, asked if they could also develop versions that would activate a particular gene. So this is termed the activation domain in the CRISPR-Cas system. And by studying the literature, they identified a couple of good candidates, um, two components of the RNA polymerase complex, the alpha and omega subunits. And they also um, attempted or tested a particular transcriptional activator protein, which they knew um, binds RNA polymerase based on the literature. So again, they were very systematic, um, built uh, the test strains and the appropriate uh, control strains. And they analyzed a number of parameters, including like what distance should these um, binding elements be and on what face of the DNA helix should the binding site be relative to the transcriptional start site. And again, in um, a really beautifully laid out um, schematic and the corresponding data in uh, figure two, they um, show again that they had great success in engineering a synthetic um, sequences where they could get um, activation, more than 20 fold activation of a particular promoter um, using these um, engineered CRISPR Cas regulatory mechanisms. So, unless either of you have anything to add about that, I thought we'll this was really cool like from like when we were in grad school or college when we learned about transcriptional activation and then now yeah. using mm. CRISPR to bring these activation sites exactly where you want so you can easily yeah, modify right. so essentially just by modifying the guide RNA you can activate in theory almost anything you want inside these it was so cool to see kind of where this idea which is old has essentially now been made into this yeah we'll call it classic yeah classic <laughs> Genetics yes. we learned in graduate school, and then taking the modern CRISPR uh, technology and applying it to a current like global health threat. Exactly, it's, it's, it's very really cool. I just wanted to say this is a great example of you, you. You develop a technology and you throw it out there, and you let people take it and do yep. think creative things, right? And yep. it's always going to happen that people will find amazing uses like this. <laughs> I love it. And it's the value of peer reviewed literature, right? It's just this huge tool chest that we can um, yeah. we can ponder and uh, put to neat use. I was also impressed with just the patience they showed. Um, they weren't happy that they, okay, we got some repression, let's move on, or we got activation. They, they took the time for the field mm. um, to really optimize this, to save other people um, time in the future. Right. And this has been a really big problem in the field. Um, we have a professor in my department, Josh Blodgett, who works on different biosynthetic operons and trying to find them and activate them and understand how they're regulated and how they're silenced, more importantly, in, in the actinomycetes. And there's a lot of regulation. So the idea that you can bypass this to really drive yeah. these things is amazing. Well, so let's see if they can, because so far they've only shown us they can do it with M. cherry, a fluorescence nice. marker they yeah. put it in the genome. So now they they put it to the test, and and it was a tough test. They chose a locus that encodes a um, poly po type two polyketide synthase um, encoded by the or what that's termed mm -hmm. um, jadomycin B, and this is encoded on twenty eight kilobases of DNA. 31 different genes um, direct the assembly of this um, enzyme and also its regulation and its transport. And 
they did not choose a simple one. Um, they already knew from the literature that at least seven different regulators control the expression of this natural product. But they took the bold, made the bold, um, had the bold goal of saying, well, let's try to bypass that using our CRISPR tools. They knew that when they grow the streptomyces in normal lab conditions, this locus is not expressed. So they studied what's known and they um, identified a particular activator and thought, or they, I'm sorry, they, a, a repressor, they identified a repressor of the synthesis and knew that it was under negative control. So they took their CRISPR um, inhibitory element and asked if they can shut off the inhibitor and therefore trick the cell into making jadamycin B under more normal growth conditions. So they show the construction of the locus, um, and schematically they show the product and all that in figure three. Um, And then after culturing the strain, they used liquid chromatography mass spec to ask whether they could get production of the compound. And in figure three, see, it's eureka, Yes, they see. <laughs> it's so cool. Beautiful peak, uh, right where they expect it for this um, natural compound. So that must have been a great day in the lab. Very encouraging. <laughs> so then they go on and say, well, can we do the opposite now? Can we use our, our um, activation element to just bypass all the endogenous repression and regulation and um, synthetically induce expression of this um, natural compound. So they take the, the element that they designed, the CRISPR um, activation element, and you know insert it into the genome where they had optimized it. And again, after doing liquid chromatography mass spec, they saw, boom, um, more mm-hmm. than 20, well, a huge, huge production of really beautiful, um, beautiful, pure uh, compound. So again, they must be, um, they're all, their hard work, their patience, their really uh, rigorous design um, paid off in a big way. Um, they systematically defined some key design parameters for CRISPR-based regulation in streptomyces and this is only the second demonstration in a gram-positive bacterium of using um, CRISPR to activate uh, gene expression after B. subtilis, a well-known and well-studied uh, gram-positive bug. They've also now contributed to the streptomyces field these two potent tools, which will allow investigators to go in and turn on or turn off particular uh, loci of interest. And that will greatly facilitate um, natural product discovery. So you can imagine now doing um, screens of different compounds. And so they're now in a position, uh, their lab and and others now, can um, really tap the full genome potential, uh, genomic potential of streptomyces to ask whether there are new antimicrobials um, encoded in the genome. Uh, Let's purify them, characterize them, um, see what use they are, and apply them to the global threat of antibiotic resistance. And then, as um, Petra pointed out, there are other um, biomanufacturing applications for many of these environmental microbes, including streptomyces. So there are um, surely many different creative uses of uh, streptomyces with these um, genetically engineered uh, strains. So hats off to them. So, what, Michelle, what, what's next? Do, they, do, do you have to do that one cluster at a time and turn it on and and look at the product and, and see what it does? Or can you do this en masse? In other words, are the regulatory signals similar enough that you could add one target, one guide RNA, and it would turn on multiple uh, loci? Yeah, my understanding is that each um, biosynthetic gene cluster um, has mm-hmm. its own regulatory system, and okay. so they would have to target each one individually. But and So um, you need to know... You have to have the genome sequence to know where the clusters are, obviously, right? Right. And that's one thing they, they describe early on is this is really a genomics-based drug yeah. discovery yeah. Um, yeah. pipeline where you start with the whole genome sequence, then you do bioinformatics and deduce um, mm-hmm. what are some interesting um, uh, loci in the genome, then apply the molecular biology and this CRISPR technology to get the cells to express mm-hmm. the um, product in a laboratory setting um, without a lot of guesswork, just 
biosynthetically or and using these engineering tools, turn it on or turn it off, mm-hmm. and then apply analytical chemistry and all the downstream uh, characterization. Right. Very cool. I mean, it's really impressive because these organisms, the actinomycetes in general, so not only, so this is just Venezuela is, I guess, one of the two big models along with Silicolor for studying the streptomyces, which are in soil and produce geomycin, which makes soil smell like soil, mm-hmm. but they produce many, in theory, many of these different uh, molecules, which could be used for not only antimicrobials, streptomyces, Tinomyces in general produce a lot of our, you know, natural products for antimicrobials, um, streptomycin being a good one. Um, but there is so much of their genes, uh, they are silenced that now if you have the sequence, which is not so hard to get, and even the bioinformatics, which I think is now, they're good pipelines for that. In theory, as long as you can get this transformed, you could easily essentially build libraries to look for, to induce expression mm-hmm. of these. It seems like the activation is more flexible. You could induce expression of a whole bunch of these and then just screen libraries where you've activated for natural products as opposed to mm-hmm. just screening the organisms as we have done in the past, looking and hoping yeah. that whatever you need is on. Now you yeah. could essentially yeah. force them to produce things, cool. which and is You super could cool. imagine a community resource would be for, for um labs to generate these on and off for every known biosynthetic gene cluster and just have that library available so that Mm -hmm. anybody, no matter what their um, application is, can just get the strain. Much like you'll talk um, in your paper about ordered um, transposon mutant libraries. Each lab doesn't have to make it themselves. Right. Years ago, when we went on vacation, my my wife worked at Merck and one of her projects was to look for antimicrobials. So it, when we went anywhere, we, she would take little Ziploc bags and we'd bring back dirt. That's great. And bring soil. In, we call it soil. <laughs> soil to the natural products uh, people. And then they would make broths. But this is a whole new level now, right? <laughs> yeah. And of course, it's not just soil. There are so many um, uh, ecosystems that we have not really tapped. Uh, certainly the ocean, the waters, um, yeah, all kinds of different um, environmental settings that are no doubt full of rich antimicrobial and other interesting compounds. So it's not just streptomyces, in other words. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you're studying a different bug, you can now just use their um, approach as kind of a guidebook to how, what steps should I take in my favorite organism um, mm-hmm. to optimize these CRISPR activation or CRISPR. CRISPR inhibition systems. Cool. Very good. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. And uh, now Petra will help shine a light on on us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the paper I'm going to discuss today, um, I actually heard about at an in-person meeting, one of the first ones I've been to in a long time, and I was really amazed by these images. And the paper itself is really delightful. Um, the title is Light Dark Temperature Cycling Modulate Metabolic Electron Flow in Pseudomonas Originosa Biofilms. It's by Lisa Julianne Kahl, Kelly Eckert, Diana Morales, Alexa Price Whelan, and Lars Dietrich at Columbia University in the Biological Sciences Department. Um, I think, Vincent, you're going to talk a little bit about Lisa. We reached mm-hmm. out to Lisa Kahl, the first author. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Lisa was, he's got a really amazing, uh, CV because she's been everywhere. She's traveled so much, and she's she's originally she went to college and uh, she went to school in Germany, and then uh, took advantage of travel and um, went went to uh, work at UCSD. And she said uh, in in some comments she provided to you. Let me bring them up here. She said. During a stay abroad at UC San Diego, I realized I wanted to do a PhD. It's it's thanks to the U.S. system of having undergraduate student assistants in the lab. Not so common in Britain and other European countries that I really got to know how first class research is undertaken. That's a really good point, right? That we don't maybe we don't appreciate because we're so used to it. But undergrads are always doing projects, and it's not so common elsewhere. And this got her interested. Otherwise, who knows what she would have done? Yeah. And she went on to get her PhD um, at. Um, Columbia at uh, Columbia University, um, and now is a postdoc. Tell us about this amazing science. Um, so, um, I, I do want to communicate that Lisa had um, a couple of really kind of nice things that she said to us. One of them was 
uh, I think an important thing that other people we've reached out to, other first authors, she mentions that it's really important to take care of yourself, their self-care during graduate school. Um, yep. She likes being outside is one of the things she likes, but I thought that was also uh, said, a yeah, good reminder for all of us. She said, so at Columbia, she was on the triathlon team which made her leave the city for races <laughs> and reset in nature. Otherwise, yeah, you stay in the city and you never. You never <laughs> exactly. It's <leave. That's> really cool. <laughs> I, I really like that. And then um, she also, uh, she just uh, received a really nice postdoctoral fellowship, the Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship, which is a really wonderful uh, congratulations to her for that. Um, so this work um, I think is really interesting because it's becoming clear, although if we thought about it, I think it would not be as surprising, but it's becoming clear that light, not only temperature, but also light impacts a lot of biological processes independent of photosynthesis. So obviously photosynthesis is plants and uh, blue-green algae, right, use the light to excite electrons and that stimulates electron flow and generates ATP and they use this to fix carbon. And, um, you know, it's really important for uh, generating substrates for non-photosynthetic metabolism. Um, but I think we forget that light is also important for other things. One big one that we, I think, are all aware of, although it has a lot of complex radi uh, regulation, is circadian rhythms. These are daily changes in body temperature, metabolic activity. These affect not only hosts, but also the microbes in the hosts. And obviously, environmental microbes are also going to experience changes in temperature and uh, depending on their location, light. You know, something else that we as humans need to be aware of, vitamin D, right, is converted by UVB light from skin-produced uh, cholesterol molecule to vitamin D3, which is then metabolized in the liver and kidneys. And without vitamin D, it's really difficult to absorb calcium. So light is really important to biology outside of photosynthesis. And this paper really focuses actually on totally different light and temperature sensitive process in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, where light and temperature impact redox metabolism. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunistic gram-negative pathogen. It's actually most, I think, well-known or infamous for it's a big problem in people who have cystic fibrosis. Um, once Pseudomonas kind of gets established in the lungs, and, um, so there's this very thick mucus. It can form biofilms, sort of these kind of very stable, intricate, sort of three-dimensional communities of bacteria, multicellular communities. They're very hard to get rid of. Um, and the immune system reacting to them and eventually leads to lung deterioration in CF patients over time. It's also pseudomonas is a big problem in burn patients. It's very, it's, yeah, it, once you kind of breach the skin barrier, it's pseudomonas takes advantage of that. It's not phototrophic. It, it, you know, eats carbon and uses that to generate electron flow. It can grow aerobically on oxygen. It can do anaerobic respiration where instead of using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, it can use several other ones. Um, but again, redox metabolism is really important. Redox is also important for other pathways, uh, fatty acid synthesis, condensation, and also involves redox. But the important thing to remember as we go through this is there's a donor in the case of Pseudomonas, and actually in our case, in our mitochondria, it's NADH, which is an organic molecule, and the electron, it's very high energy, and the electron is broken off of NADH, it takes the proton and the hydrogen molecule uh, with it, and it goes down the electron transport chain, which you might remember from intro biology. But as the electron moves down, it releases energy, and that can be used to make a, pro a gradient for proton motive force or do other kinds of work. And ultimately, in aerobic respiration, the electron and hydrogen end up on oxygen, making water, which is the terminal. Oxygen would be the terminal electron acceptor. But if there's something else, it can also end up on, you know, that electron can end up on something else and reduce it. <laughs> so in our case, um, again, Pseudomonas is growing it has respiration to generate ATP, um, transport other things. It also can generate just whatever it's being fed. Uh, it can use that for biosynthesis, but it has respiration going on in the background. And its respiration rate can vary in terms of environment and what 
this paper shows is that its rate of respiration, how much electron flow and reduction is going on, redox is going on, can vary with light and temperature. And they based this paper uh, in previous work from their lab um, that biofilm formation, again, which is the big problem for cystic fibrosis patients, it's sensitive to light. And one of the proteins that regulates biofilm formation integrates both light and redox information. And so based on that, they wanted to kind of understand better how light and temperature might impact uh, respiration and redox in cystic fibrosis. And they used an in vitro system where they can embed in the medium something called uh, triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride, TTC. Um, sometimes it's just called tetrazoleum. And when you have it in the, in the media, so in this case on the solid petri uh, media in the petri dish, when there's an electron that's flowing down the electron transport chain, it sometimes ends up on tetrazoleum instead of whatever its terminal electron acceptor should be. And when it ends up on tetrazoleum, it turns red. So if you have high respiration, the colonies turn really dark red. If you have low respiration rates, they stay very light pink or almost the normal beige color. So red indicates high rates of respiration, low rates of respiration are the lighter color. So what they find is that when they make, they use special media so that pseudomonas can form biofilms on plates and they essentially put down a little bit of cells in the middle and it spreads out and forms this sort of giant spreading colony. Imagine it taking up most of the plate. When they expose it to dark, so the cells are grown in the dark on tetrazoleum, the colony, this giant colony is very dark, sorry, in the dark, it's very red, indicating that it's a high rate of respiration. If they only grow it in light conditions, it starts off with a dark, the biofilms, these big giant biofilm colonies have a dark center, kind of like a bullseye, and then it gets light at the edges. So it looks like in the dark, the respiration peaks, it's maybe a little redder in the center and then doesn't trail off much. But if you grow it in the light, when this colony starts growing, it's very high rate of respiration, and then it tails off over time. Okay, so that was sort of the initial observation. And then what they do is they alternate light-dark cycles. So they have 12-hour light, 12-hour dark. So in 24-hour cycles, half light, half dark. And what they see is something that looks very much like tree rings. Hmm. So the center of the colony, the center of the biofilm is uh, kind of one color and then starts off maybe red and then goes to like lighter color. When they switch, they get a ring of red and then it trails off. When they switch back, it goes again. So you've got like rings of light and dark. They again look more like tree rings, I think is the best, or an ombre kind of effect. They see this with light-dark cycles. They're using full-spectrum light here. They see it with temperature cycling as little as plus and minus one degree. They've, amazing. I know. It's amazing. They had to get a special – this is one of the things in uh, Dr. Carl's uh, email to us – that they had to get a very special, very precise incubator. Like the incubators my lab use probably vary as much as three degrees over time. I mean, you could never use them, but these are plus and minus – I think they even have it down to a tenth of a degree. Very stable temperature. They see the same kind of cycling with only one degree of temperature difference between 24 and 25 degrees centigrade. And the assay is just so elegant. They show photographs of these beautiful ring-like structures, tree ring-like structures that are just stunning. And then they've got quantitative data. Um, so they're able to trace and yeah. uh, quantitate, basically reflect uh, rate of respiration. Right. So the, the, it's it's really cool. So first they put these together and they get more pronounced rings. The rings are more like darker and lighter when they use temperature and light, when they have light and high temp and dark and low temp or vice versa, they get more pronounced rings. They shorten the cycle. The rings are thinner. The longer cycles, the rings are thicker. So then they do, as Michelle said, these quantitations. So they're basically looking at pictures and they can give the red color a value and the light color a different value. And they can look at a range pixel by pixel. And when you look over time, you can see stimulation in TTC in the, in the reduction 
of this molecule, the tetrazoleum, you can see a reduction right when they switch from mm. when you go from light to dark or dark to light, there's a stimulation and you get a high rate of reduction when you switch them, the cells to the new condition. And then it eventually trails off. If they let it go 10 to 15 hours after the switch, they see the biggest difference. So they get a peak and then by 10 or 15 hours, it trails off. And they get a bigger peak when they go from light to dark. So the amplitude of the stimulation is higher on dark, but they also see one on light. So it's something about the switch and dark for some reason is a better stimulus of the respiration, initial burst in respiration than going to light, but they see it either way. And what they speculate is that, so again, you've got a single, you can inoculate just in the middle of the plate and then um, on the media, and then the cells grow out in a circle, kind of spreading. If you've ever, you know, you put a drop of something and it spreads out uh, in a circle, right? So they speculate that here, though, is cells growing. So the new cells, and then you get cells on the outside growing. So the newest the newborn cells are all on the edge of this giant colony. And they speculate these new cells are at the leading edge of the biofilm. They're perceptive so that they speculate the reason you get this initial stimulation is they sense the switch that activates respiration. And then eventually they kind of forget about that stimulation. And so then it kind of goes, uh, the amount of respiration kind of trails off until the next switch. So that suggested that the cells were kind of remember that some cells are active respiration and maybe some cells are, are less active. And they do this really cool experiment, which is in figure four, which is to show the cells remember that it's not like they reduce the tetrazoleum and then they kind of forgot. They actually grow a biofilm doing light dark switching on medium without tetrazoleum. So they generate this giant kind of biofilm. And then they, after it's generated, right, they now have it, they're able to move it to a new plate without, with tetrazoleum. And they put it in constant dark. And what they see is that they can still see the rings as if the cells that initially had high respiration continued to have that high respiration long after they're no longer at the leading edge of the colony. So that that was really they're imprinted by that experience. Exactly. They're That's imprinted wild. or somehow once it's active, it's maintained. And I just thought that was I mean, the idea that bacteria remember, especially after that long period of time, especially these cells, which are probably not growing, they're really stuck in the middle of all these other cells, they probably don't have a lot of nutrients, but they're still maintaining this high rate of respiration, I thought was pretty interesting. That would be a great preliminary exam question for somebody in graduate school, like give them that biology and then ask them to imagine how to wire a cell, the, wire the regulatory pathway <laughs> that, would, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that would produce that effect. <laughs> how, would you, how would you create memory? Somebody's going to say methylation for sure. Um, <laughs> and then, so they have a couple of questions, right? They see this, they show that there's some kind of sensory cells, probably at the leading edge, and they show that the cells remember in some way, or they once they're activated for high levels of respiration, they maintain it, although it's kind of tamped down in subsequent generations. They want to identify, they're curious because they've been showing it essentially white, these organisms white light. Uh, they want to know, are is it white light that's important or is it some kind of, or is there you know different wavelengths sense? often in light sensing, right, the sensor molecules sense particular wavelengths. Um, to do that, they use this ordered transposon library basically to pull out mutations in genes with PAS and GAF, PAS and GAF domains. They pick these genes because those two domains have been implicated in previous work in light sensing. Doing this sort of directed screen, they identify two proteins, one called BPHP and one called PTSP. And when they knock them out, they see dampening. They still see the patterning, but it's less. The amplitude of the activation is lower under red light, but under blue or far red, they still see the patterning. So BPHP and PTSP seem to be important for sensing red light, but not blue or far red. 
and they couldn't really find any genes for blue or far red. What they think might be going on is the cells have other cofactors and metabolites, flavins, cytochromes, things like that, which might be sensing it. And maybe that's altering the activity of those that is then altering the respiration rate. Um, they do a kind of nice micro dissection. Um, so they've got these giant colonies and they want to know if the cells grown in the dark or on the leading edge might be expressing genes differently. Uh, if there's some kind of regulation, like are the genes expressed in the dark different from the ones that are expressed in the light grown cells? And they actually get some pretty big changes. They definitely see some that are different, but uh, it looks like there is some level of regulation. It's just hard to know whether the regulation is downstream of the change in respiration or upstream of the change in respiration. Um, they then want to look and see what might be going on. So again, respiration uh, in bacteria or mitochondria or whatever usually involves a series of proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane and the electron kind of gets handed off, giving off energy every time it goes down to the next protein until it ends up on the terminal electron acceptor. And in that electron transport chain and that handoff process, proteins called cytochromes are really important. And there are many cytochromes, they do many things, but uh, in electron transport, they're intermediates, they're part of the handoff process. And Pseudomonas has two that are known to be really important, kind of the major cytochromes for electron transport and respiration in Pseudomonas. There are also two additional ones that can be swapped in. So there's two that are not essential for respiration, but they're sort of the ones that Pseudomonas prefers to use. And then there are two that can be swapped in. They do some really nice genetics to show that the two major ones, if they delete the two major ones, they see less of an increase uh, increase in TCC reduction. So the increase in respiration is more gradual and it goes down more slowly. So basically the stimulation where you see the sort of increase in respiration after the switch, it takes longer to get up to its peak, um, much longer to get up to that peak. It might get to less of a peak. So it seems like there are a lot of things involved in this process. Some might actually, it might be impacting the transport directly. That cytochrome experiment suggests maybe there's something about the major cytochromes that are important in that process. It could be impacting things uh, in these cofactors and metabolites. There could be some regulation, although they haven't identified it. Um, but it's clear that respiration is really sensitive, not only to temperature, and you can imagine temperature makes a lot of sense, right? Reactions, most reactions go faster at higher temperature. So respiration might be activated by that. And you can see how that happens. But how does light do it? Um, I think it's less clear. I think it's really beautiful and also really makes me think and about how light can be impacting metabolic activity independent of photosynthesis. I do think one of the big open questions, and I think you could, this is, you could speculate about it, is what does lower respiration mean? Why is it higher in the dark? Why is it lower in, the, in light? Um, and is this some kind of advantage for this organism? Again, when it's infecting a person, you might imagine somebody with a fever is going to have higher temperature, but is the, how is the light impacting pseudomonas inside the host, I think is really unclear. But I do think it sort of points to light being really important in biology outside of photosynthesis, which is something we don't think about very often. Yeah, so many different things to think about. They, they do um, remind us that light can damage some enzymes and sensitive proteins, so it could be a protective mechanism. Or I don't know. If, I guess the question is: in the dark or in the light, can't they just can't respire? Or they choose not to. <laughs> I think they they choose to respire more slowly or less less right. overall respiration. There are fewer electrons moving down the electron transport yeah. chain. Um, it was also amazing to me when they did their RNA um, profiling experiment how many major metabolic pathways were clearly sensitive. 
Right. Uh, they the got a lot of pathways. And again, glutathione metabolism, <laughs> pentose phosphate pathway, nitrogen metabolism, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I don't know what that means. Again, a lot of these might have light sensitive molecules involved. A lot of them, right, because the NADH has to be recycled, right? The donor has to be recycled. If you have less to run glycolysis, yeah. you have to recycle NADH, NAD plus. Maybe if you're not running respiration fast enough, it might slow down those processes and that right. might have some feedback. It's really unclear. And it's also unclear, I think, not, I mean, this is clearly happening. And so in that sense, it's really physiologically relevant, but is it happening in, you know, is, has the cell evolved to have this process or is this process happening because there's so many light sensitive molecules? And I think that's going to be very difficult to pull apart unless you can find, you know, some kind of regulation you can unhook. Because hmm. what does it mean if Pseudomonas has more respiration? I don't know. I mean, because Pseudomonas, I think grows, it grows without, it can grow like E. coli and other bacteria, at least for a while without having to run too much electron transport. So, so this was, was done with Pseudomonas, but presumably other bacteria do this as well. It could be studied in them and there might be differences. Right. Absolutely. I think, you know, yeah. they use Pseudomonas. It's one of their models and it makes yeah. sense uh, in terms of thinking about biofilms. It's very important. Yeah. Uh, the biofilms, Pseudomonas biofilms are a big problem. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think you could look in lots of other bacteria. Yeah. But what a great experimental system to dive into this. And as uh, Lisa pointed out, like the fact that Pseudomonas was sensitive to just a one degree C <laughs> change is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she, she she wrote about that. She says, uh, I remember when we first saw that the phenotype is not only driven by light and temperature, but also by light and temperature separately. My colleague Cole had spent quite some time calibrating our amazing new incubator that could fine-tune temperature by 0 0.1 degrees C, as you mentioned. So when we looked at the biofilms after our first experiment with only light-dark changes at constant temperature, it was marvelous to see how well the bacteria responded to just one stimulus. However, two other findings from our paper still astound me even more. One, the adaptation of pseudomonas to only one degree C changes over a range of temperatures. How this might be regulated is a wonderful topic to speculate about. And two, the entrenchment of the adaptation within the biofilm. I was flabbergasted when I first saw that the different biofilm zones maintain their redox activity status for such a long time after being formed. Right. I think we that, mentioned. the fact that they remember it goes to yeah. that it's probably not some kind of just incidental physical process where the higher temperature or the light somehow yeah. temporarily modulates something. It becomes fixed. So that does suggest that there is some kind of transcriptional or some kind of other modification or regulatory step going on that becomes fixed. Because if it were just high temp stimulated respiration, you would expect it as soon as you drop the temp, mm -hmm. you would expect it to stop. Right. So. Right. Um, so I wanted to just point out, I mentioned that she has moved around. So she went to high school in Germany in Potsdam, and she'd spent 12 months as a high school exchange student in New Zealand. Wow. <laughs> She's okay. very adventurous. <laughs> and then she um, did that uh, that program abroad at UCSD, which got her excited about doing uh, a PhD, which she did at uh, at Columbia. And uh, at Columbia, you get, a, you get a master's, you get an MPhil, and then you get a PhD. Uh, and then, and now she is a postdoc at the Charité University of Medicine, Berlin. Uh, and as um, as Petra mentioned, she has this uh, Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship, which she says is thanks to my rich PhD experience, experience at Columbia. And she she also, besides liking to get out of the city and, and reset in nature, she thinks that science Twitter is amazing. She <laughs> finds a lot of preprints and papers. And hears about new initiatives and job openings. She highly encourages young researchers to get a science Twitter. Community is great too. It's better than Med Twitter. Med, med Twitter is a cesspool. People, <laughs> who th people who think they can cure everything for you. <laughs> Microbiology Twitter is 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 very good. I will agree with her. It's yeah. very positive. Anyway, um, that's a great that's a great uh, piece of work, Lisa. And we we liked hearing about it. And thanks for your 
for your insights as well. Just a completely different concept um, that a fact that a, a non photosynthetic organism yeah. metabolism yeah. is so trained to light dark cycles. Yeah, it speaks to how important light is for us and we don't even think about the ways it might be. I think also I would encourage people to go to the TWIM website, uh, the episode site to look at this paper because we can describe mm. what these plates look like. But I think if you see them, yeah. it will become very clear what we're talking about. It's I would have loved to have been in the lab when they first pulled those plates out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I feel like I want to try it now with E. coli and Klebsiella wow. and the things we have in my lab. Yeah, yeah. What meeting was it that you heard this at? Uh, this was at the um, Microbial Stress Response Gordon Research Conference, which is nice. really fun. And you see a lot of a wide range of different research. So we, you know, everything from this to some really cool structural biology on antibiotics and penicillin binding proteins to symbiotic bacteria that are uh, mutualists or symbionts. And um, it was mm. really it's a great meeting. Highly recommend also for trainees. Um, but yeah, this this one uh, definitely captured the audience because of these pictures. Mm, yep. Well, thank you, Petra, for that. And that'll do it for TWIM number 272, the, the website microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can find links to the paper. Uh, and uh, you can send us questions and comments, TWIM at microbe.tv. If you like our work, consider supporting us financially. Microbe TV is a nonprofit organization that depends on your charity. And uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute, a variety of ways that you can help us out there. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. A pleasure to be with you both. And Petra Levin is at Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis. Thanks, Petra. Thank you. It's, it's great to be back and see you guys. I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.